everybody. My name is Graham Elwood, and you are watching Boom, the Political Vigilante. Well, uh, this country is, you know, we're watching a, a country collapse in real time. And I hear a lot of people on both sides or all sides talk about civil war. We're, you know, and everyone, and everyone's like gung ho for it. The second amendment people, the Antifa, everyone's like fired up. Let's do this. I don't think Americans have the foggiest idea of what having a civil war on our soil means. Even, even combat vets who fought in Iraq and Afghanistan who were like, all right, we're ready. I got combat training. Yes, you do. You were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I've been to many, many of those fire bases where you were heavily funded and supplied by the United States. You could go back to your base and then eventually fly back home and be away from the war zone. You don't even know what it's like living. No American has a clue what a war on our soil looks like and what it would be like. So there's no fortified base to go back to because who's fortifying you? If America's in a civil war, that means we've collapsed. So where, where's, where are the supplies coming from? There's no like, I get two weeks leave. I get to go to, you know, Dubai or I fly home for two weeks and see my kids and go to Walmart. No, Walmart's bombed out. Right. And even the people of the lefties and I, and, and the second amendment conservatives think that the left is all a bunch of like liberals that are snowflakes that don't, and they don't realize like every black person I know has a gun. A lot of lefties have guns, uh, but again, Americans are so fired up for this civil war. I don't think you understand how awful it looks like on American soil. And so I want to show you some videos of some three different civil wars, Syria, Yugoslavia, and Northern Ireland. So this is Syria. The city of Raqqa, Syria, is relatively calm now after years of civil war, Islamic State rule, and then the devastating battles that ousted Look at the this. militants. Parts of the city are even being rebuilt. Other parts are overwhelmed with displaced families from areas still at war. Locals say, despite the relative safety here, recovery. I just want to show you this. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the civil war in Syria. I just want to show you what civil war looks like. <clears throat> and there's all these things you haven't thought of thought of. So this is civil war isn't just guns. It's bombing. If we get a civil war, that means someone's going to get a hold of some military grade equipment. And there's going to be rockets and bombs. You don't, we have no idea. You have no idea what rockets and bombs are like in America. We have no idea. We have no idea what a minefield is like. We have a good idea what gunfire is because we have a hundred gun deaths a day. We've had 700 mass shootings in 2021, 700. <laughs> That's insane. That is scary. And as horrifying as that is, that is nothing. That is a fucking Chuck E. Cheese party compared to this bombed out buildings, displaced people. You think there's 10 cities because of homelessness now? What if they're just, oh, there was a big battle. There was a big battle in LA. There was a big battle in Dallas. There was a big battle in whatever. And there's bombed out buildings now. It's a long way off. We are psychologically exhausted and the situation is getting worse. Aside from the sadness, the humiliation and the destruction, all of our homes are gone. I lost my husband in an airstrike. So again, this isn't a video game. This isn't paintball. This isn't some action movie, Jason Bourne. All those combat vets from Iraq and Afghanistan, they most of them have PTSD. But it's another thing when it's around you on a daily basis. You're not safe. You're not, you're living in a tent. Your home was burnt down. Your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son killed, raped. <clears throat> this village is set on fire. There's no water. There's no electricity. I really want, I want everyone to see what this, what this, just imagine now, this is not a woman in Syria. This is a woman outside of Cleveland. This is a woman outside of, you know, in Florida. 
because we had to we bombed the this group in Florida. This is L.A. This is Denver, right? The conservatives like say, "Oh, it only happened in those liberal cities." Okay, bunch of Californians just moved to Texas. The Syrian civil war marked its tenth year in 2021, with many speculating that the government of President Bashar al-Assad will eventually retake what is called the last rebel stronghold, Idlib. Many Idlib residents are staunch in their commitment to remain outside the reach of the government. But the war is no longer so much of a popular rebellion, but more of a stalemate involving the government, Turkey, and other powers. Some parts of Idlib are held by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, a U.S.-designated terrorist organization. Turkey controls other parts and an area that was only two years ago controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces, the military of Syria's semi-autonomous Kurdish region. I'm showing you this again. I'm not, not bringing this up to bring up some sort of discussion or debate about what happened in Syria. But you see outside forces, Turkey, the U.S., Russia. So if we've devolved into a civil war, what do you think? You think Russia and China are just going to watch? What's going to happen? And if we're in a civil war, let me make this very clear. Canada and Mexico will lock their borders because we'll have a bunch of refugees and we're going to be sneaking across the Mexican border and the Canadian border. And they're going to finally line those borders with soldiers and say, hey, America, stay in your, your country. It's not. And where are you going to go? <clears throat> There's going to be American refugees in boats in the Gulf of Mexico. Taking boats from California. I mean, you live in, I mean, you're on the West Coast. Where are you going to go? Take a boat to Hawaii? It's 2,500 miles. I mean, it's going to be like that. That's what it, that, I just want everyone to know what a civil war in American soil. Oh, it well, can't happen here. We're nice, big America. Okay. Other countries will intervene. We're send we'll, uh, this, this. And there's all these frac fractions, right? The Proud Boys or this or <clears throat> Antifa or, right? And a bunch of Californians, like I said, a bunch of Californians just moved to Texas and they're all buying guns. <laughs> all these liberal lefties <coughs> that Second Amendment conservatives think, oh, they're soft. They all bought guns. That's not good. And then all the weapons that all of our national guards have, someone's going to, some, some general's going to take this national guard and fight that one. And then they're going to, someone's going <laughs> to seize control of an armory. You don't think that's what happened and all that's what happens in civil wars. There's no law and order. There's no law and order. Let's learn about what happened in Yugoslavia in the nineties. Joseph Tito, who had kept Yugoslavia together since world war II, died in 1980 just as the USSR began reforming and the Yugoslav economy began declining. The IMF agreed to loan Yugoslavia money, but required a series of reforms which worsened unemployment. IMF, we've talked about that before. The, 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 and this is, I wanted to show you this again, not to go into the specifics of the Yugoslavian and some of this in this video might be debatable. Actually, some people think it was this or this reason. I'm just showing you how convoluted it was, how complex it was. <clears throat> and again, the IMF, and it started years before. It was building for years in the 80s. And decentralized the Communist Party and helped fuel nationalism. However, who became nationalistic first is still a matter of debate. So to explain Yugoslavia briefly, there were six republics. There were the wealthy Catholic republics of Slovenia and Croatia who <clears throat> sought closer relations with Europe, the poorer Orthodox Republic of Macedonia, the Central Orthodox Republics of Montenegro and Serbia, and the Muslim Republic of Bosnia. Plus, Serbia had two autonomous regions, Vojvodina and Kosovo. However, Kosovo was largely inhabited by Muslim Albanians, Croatia had a large Serb population, and Bosnia had a large population of Serbs and Croats. So, calls for greater autonomy grew louder throughout the 1980s, and unrest soon followed, particularly in Kosovo, where the Serbs felt persecuted by the Albanian majority. In the midst of the unrest in Kosovo, Slobodan Milosevic became a Serbian hero in 1987 by promising to protect Serbs against the alleged persecution. This helped encourage a wave of protests across Yugoslavia, which aimed to unite Serbs. And just real clear, this Chris Hedges covered this, right? And Chris Hedges talks about how 
when the ruling elites take all the money and people don't have jobs and social services are gutted and all this other stuff happens, he, he Chris Hedges always uses the term, people like Slobodan Milosevic get vomited out when neoliberal policy crushes the working elites and then nationalism rises. Well, that's what's happened in America, right? 30, 40 years of, of neoliberal globalist policies. We've shipped all of our jobs overseas. Americans are poor. Americans don't have jobs. Good union jobs are gone. <clears throat> we have an opioid epidemic crushing this country. We have poverty. All these issues that were in place before the pandemic, the pandemic just made them worse. This rise of nationalism, that's, what, that's the thing that people, you know, liberals missed what Trump said. All they heard was Trump's racist rhetoric, and he had plenty of it. But they missed that he was a populist. He was saying, I was going to bring your job back. That's what make America great. He would give speeches in front of factories that were close. I'm going to bring your job back. While Hillary was doing, you know, $50,000, $100,000 a plate dinners, <clears throat> Trump was saying, I'm going to bring your, because working class whites have been crushed, just like working class, any group has been crushed in America. <clears throat> I want you to see how similar this is. And when people don't have jobs and they're hungry, then nationalism rises up and they say that group, they stole your job. We hear it here, all oh, the, the Mexicans are coming across the border stealing your Trump ran on a very racist, xenophobic campaign. <clears throat> a Mexican didn't steal your job. A billionaire did. And billionaires are very good at keeping people fighting with each other. Just and remove any ineffective leaders. By 1989, the anti-bureaucratic revolution had succeeded in putting Milosevic and his allies in power in Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Vojvodina. However, they were prevented from protesting in Slovenia by the Croatians, plus the Slovenians, who were already angry at the arrest of journalists, lent their support to the striking Kosovan miners. Angered, Milosevic and Labor strike? This group backed this lab labor strikes. I'm just, we've had a lot of labor strikes and rightfully so. I'm glad there's labor strikes. I'm just saying, does this sound familiar? Sanctions on Slovenian goods, but this just made Slovenia walk out of the Congress of the League of Communists in January 1990, ending the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. With the collapse of the Communist Party, the first multi-party elections took place in 1990, and independence parties took power in Macedonia, Bosnia, Slovenia, and Croatia. But the Serbs living in Croatia feared that the new national government may commit the same atrocities the Croatian nationalists did in World War II. So they began to form militias while the Croatians and Slovenians began to import... Form militias? Does that sound familiar? ...from abroad. With rising tensions and nationalism, small clashes between local forces took place, and there seemed to be no sign of a solution. So Slovenia and Croatia declared independence in June 1991, starting the wars. For the homogenous Slovenia, the war was only 10 days. The peace somewhat delayed their independence, but the federal army focused on Croatia, so Slovenia was free to break away from Yugoslavia. Meanwhile, the Serbs of Croatia had declared their own independence. Then, through a series of bloody battles, notably at Bukovar, they began to expel the Croats from their new republic, Serbian Krahina, while the Yugoslav army lay siege to Dubrovnik. However, the city never fell. As they fought, Macedonia was able to peacefully declare their own independence. After a few months of fighting, the UN called for a ceasefire in Croatia in January 1992 and sent troops in to keep the peace. This peace allowed both the Serbians and Croatians to turn their attention to Bosnia, which they both sought to partition. In March 1992, the Bosnians voted for independence and violence erupted shortly afterwards as Bosnian Serbs declared their own independence. These Serbs pushed the Bosniaks from their new republic and lay siege to Sarajevo, while the Croat-Bosniak war erupted in July. The armies were made up mainly of volunteers and mercenaries, many of which held extremist views, Mujahideen, paramilitary, neo-Nazis, etc. So, a number of atrocities. Mujahideen, paramilitary, neo-Nazis. All these militias, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers. Remember January 6th? These were committed by all sides. However, the Bosniaks bore the brunt of these crimes. Over the next year, the Bosniaks lost a great deal of land. However, they were able to keep control of Sarajevo and fight off some advances. But the situation changed in 1993 when Clinton became president of the USA and got involved in the conflict. The UN had imposed sanctions on Serbian Montenegro, successfully keeping them from entering the Bosnian war directly. 
So through threats of sanctions, the West managed to pressure Croatia into making peace with Bosnia in early 1994 and joined forces to fight the new Serbian republics. The Bosniaks and Croats pushed on land and, in mid-1995, they were aided by NATO airstrikes. With comparatively limited support, the republics of Srpska and Krahina finally had to accept peace at the end of the year. The republics were annexed by Croatia and Bosnia and this put an end to the chance of a greater Serbia. So Yugoslavia was left only with Serbia and Montenegro, however tensions remained high in Kosovo. Initially, independence movements in Kosovo were peaceful, but they became violent in 1996 with the foundation of the Kosovan Liberation Army, which received training and money from the West. Their attacks on Yugoslav authorities intensified until Milosevic, then president of Yugoslavia, responded and the Kosovan war erupted in early 1998. But a year into the conflict, NATO responded by conducting a series of airstrikes on Serbia, forcing Milosevic to withdraw his troops. Milosevic was later ousted from power after a disputed election, and Yugoslavia became Serbia and Montenegro. But in 2006, a referendum narrowly passed and the two nations split. Then, with foreign troops still in Kosovo, Kosovo declared independence in 2008, however many nations have not recognized it. <clears throat> there's some there's some general similarities right airstrikes i mean again none of this americans can't fathom like airstrikes and mortar fire they can't fathom it on this soil but and there was ethnic cleansing horrific where they would like take young girls and and from the other ethnic group and rape them and they were being ethnically cleansed. It was mass rape. It was horrific. It was horrific. Here's just some photos from uh, Belfast, Ireland in the early 70s. Bombings. <clears throat> there was the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. They wanted Northern Ireland to join back with Ireland. And then there was the Ulster Defense Force, basically, um, that wanted Northern Ireland to stay as part of uh, Britain. That look fun in your neighborhood where you live, your kids playing in rubble, uh, bomb damage police station in Belfast, November 71 in which police inspector died. So just random bombings and explosions. <clears throat> right. The Rittenhouse verdict. They're showing up at protests. Uh, the second amendment right is showing up with automatic weapons. So now lefties are going to show up with automatic weapons. It's going to be crazy. Just pipe bombs and madness. This is a curfew. <clears throat> Santa Monica, California in uh, June of 2020 had military on the streets and the downtown by the civic, uh, by the, City Hall was blocked off by the military. There was military on the streets in Santa Monica and Los Angeles and cities all over America. Remember George Floyd summer? This is just from Portland. Remember Portland? Just one of the cities? 58th straight day, of right? This is from George Floyd. This is Portland. Federal officers, remember that? Everyone's like, Trump's evil federal officers. Mm. They were allowed, that was allowed to happen thanks to uh, Obama. photo from January 6th. Really want a civil war? 
I think twice. I don't care what side you're on, what you think. <clears throat> it'll be hell on earth. You think it's bad in America now? It'll be hell on earth. It'll be awful. Just think it through because you've never been in a war on American soil. You don't know what a war on your home soil looks like. Even if you're a combat veteran, you flew in, you were deployed, had all this equipment and showers set up, Taco Bell on the bases, and you got to Skype back home with your family. And <clears throat> nope. No electricity, no internet, no nothing. This general fighting on this, this general of the National Guard fighting on this, this general fighting, it'll be, it'll be madness. Russia in the 90s? I just want to show Americans have no historical context and they don't understand. They don't understand. And everyone wants like, okay. And a real civil war, it'll make what happened in Portland. It'll make January 6th look like a Disney parade. And there's only, we only border two countries and the rest of it is C. So Americans will be sealed off and we won't be able to go anywhere. And we'll be on refugee boats going into Central and South America. <sighs> Canada shut its borders down during COVID. You don't think they've had the Canadian military, the Canadian parliament has had conversations about if America goes belly up. We got to lock it down because we don't, we can't, we can't handle all these Americans coming up here. 330 million people are at war with each other. You're going to have what? 20, 30 million people just trying to flee. <clears throat> Think it through. Think it through. You big Antifa, you're big Second Amendment conservative, and you're like, it's time for a revolution. Okay. It's going to be awful. No medical care, no nothing. I think the healthcare in America is bad now. Wait till there's a civil war. You might have a lot of guns and ammo. All right. Someone's just going to set your house on fire. <laughs> Cut off your supply lines. <clears throat> then what? People will become barbaric. That's what happened. All those war criminals from Serbia. So you'll either have that done to you or you will become that type of person. Some of the, some of the people in the, the war crimes that they, they got, they were cops. They were all right. It's not a video game. Thanks for watching. Shave your knuckles for justice. Boom. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. We are still in our like ninth month of demonetization from YouTube. So support what we're doing at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. It's free to sign up and there's a premium level at $10 a month. And for that, you get everybody on the platform's premium content. Myself, Lee Camp, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Whitney Webb, Kim Iverson, Abby Martin, and many, many others. You can also support what we're doing at Venmo at Graham-Elwood and go to GrahamElwood.com. We have a PayPal button and a PO box. I also have crypto wallets, which are all in the show notes. Thanks for supporting what we do.